recording. <laughs> and okay, before we get into too much detail, um, does anybody have any questions or, or things that have cropped up um, that you'd like us to look at? The intention today was to continue what we did the other the other month, I guess it was, where we kind of wandered through the menus a little bit and looked at some of the functions, features, and, uh, and fleshed them out a little bit just so people could kind of see what they are, demonstrate them a little bit, maybe not an in, in-detail in teaching, but at least then people can see what, what the functionality is and they can dig into it later. And then uh, questions that come up and, and group suggestions and things that other people have learned that they can share with the group. Tim, I, I have one question, uh, or one thing that if we have time, maybe it's of interest to others, I don't know. I attempted to bring some things in on Canvas, mm -hmm. and I took a picture of an item I was trying to make in a, 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 a little assembly to go on, but I had a hard time orienting it so that it would be in one of the planes. Is there mm -hmm. some ways to do that, some tricks to that that I'm not seeing? Um. If we have time at the end, let's have a quick look through it. If not, I'll dig into it. Um, I'll dig into it after the class and get back to you on it in a day or two. Um, I'm trying to trying to recall. I think we we basically put it put the canvas onto a plane, and maybe we need to define the plane first. Um, trying to remember exactly, but. Um, We'll, 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 we'll go to that. I was trying to take the picture in what would be the plane, but it was very difficult to get oriented exactly right. And it uh, really distorted what, what I was doing. Yeah, the, the, the picture itself needs to be normal to the camera so that it's a, a flat picture. If the, if the picture is, or is oriented, because it's a 2D picture, you can't sort of reorient it um, from, from the picture itself. <clears throat> kind of like that donut that we see in front of us. If that's really round, you're going to have a hard time making that round on a canvas. Yeah, that's, that's, not, that's not a canvas item, that one, for sure. Yeah, I know. But I'm just saying, if right now, it's a 2D picture in our perspective on our display but yeah right right um yeah and um uh, from from the computer's point of view it's it's three dimensions um but when you bring in a photo it's just a flat sheet um and uh, I don't want to fumble through it right now because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember the specifics of, of everything we did. Uh, it was is in your, uh, I mean, it was in the video. I don't know if uh, Dallas, if you went through his video. I did. But I you did. Okay. Because I built the yeah. plaque based exactly on how he did his, you know, deal. And uh, it worked just the way you know, he did it. I was well, marginally successful, but it was, I just really had a hard time with it. Yeah, I think the, the catch is to define the plane first, either make a surface or, or create a plane, and then, and then edit in there. In fact, you know what? I'm actually feeling confident enough that I'm willing to give this a try. Are you guys all seeing my screen? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay, let's go to a new window here. And let's, let's see the origin. And let's create um, a plane that we want to put the canvas on. So let's say we want to put the canvas on something and it's not any of the origin planes. So we can create um, an offset plane, say, and we'll define this offset plane to be up here somewhere. And now we'll select a plane and we'll insert a canvas. Now, the problem is, do I have a good canvas to insert? Um, 
Uh, you must have a widget in there somewhere. <laughs> you you would think so. <laughs> How about whatever this board is? Um, there you go. So it's on this plane. Oh, this is the cutting board. Yeah. So now we can we can slide it around, and we can rotate it about the normal, but. It's on this plane that we had previously defined. Uh, Tim, Tim, what was the step between defining the plane and importing the canvas that had the canvas attached to that plane? Uh, basically, I selected the plane before I hit the insert. I'll do that again. Okay, great. So basically, in fact, now I have none selected. So I'm going to do insert, insert canvas. Um, let's go find the picture again. That was um, board. And then it says select a face. So it didn't say this last time because I had pre-selected this plane. Got it. So now that it's there, you know, we can slide it around. We want to move it just in one direction. We can do this. Uh, this gives us the ability to, to move it in both directions. Um, this is flipping it. And what do we got here? Uh, oh, we have rotate. And what are these guys? Oh, this is scaling. Scale. And uh, the corner is uh, keeping the aspect ratio. Alternatively, I think I can screw up the aspect ratio this way. But the key point, if I understand, Alice, your question, um, is that it needs to be, um, you need to have the plane defined that you want to put it at. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I the, the the cutting board I think we took off of uh, didn't you take that off of uh, a Google Images or something that was a uh, right it was just a top view that was a perfect top view I'm trying yeah. to find a way that I can actually take the pictures in a in a real life situation and actually get it in that plane that's reasonably close and I wasn't very successful it maybe my maybe it's my photography more than the <laughs> more than the uh, fusion issue. Yeah, so the, the, the key is the image really needs to be a top view. You know, it needs to be a, a face on view. Um, if you take an image that's like an isometric view and you drop it in there, you have a flat image, but it's isometric. And so you can't really get to a surface view of it. Yeah, isometric I get would, would not do it. I took a, a top a, a, in, a, in a side view but I just couldn't, did not get it to come in and, and uh, keep the proportions right. Mm -hmm. uh, I must not have been straight on in the, in the right plane. It's well, one of the a photography you, problem. Remember, one of the things you can do is you can, um, you, if, you, if you get it in and the aspect ratio is, is off, you know, you can kind of do what, what, what we did here by, um, playing with the aspect ratio. You know, there's, there's different- That I didn't play with. I probably could have done that because I wasn't perfectly straight on is what I think happened. Right, right. Yeah, it does some, some funny things here. Um, okay, that was interesting. Um, now, last time around, we, we pretty much got through the create menu, as I recall. Does anybody have any questions on elements on the create menu, uh, either that weren't fleshed out well enough or that I didn't cover, or you just need a refresher on? Are you talking only about under solids or also surface and other things? Uh, well, let's start with solids. Um, but 
Yeah, I mean, surface, a lot of them are somewhat similar. We didn't get into patch. Um, this is where you define uh, a boundary of a surface and then patch it into a surface. And that can be flat or it can be three dimensional. Um, an offset, you can take an existing surface in your, in your model. It can be a, a, a true surface or it can be the face of a solid and create um, something at, at an angle so, uh, or at, a, at an offset. Let's go back to solid for a second and let's just, um, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delete this uh, canvas. And um, also the plane. And let's fit ourselves in here somewhere. Okay. Um, wait, why am I not seeing my origin here? Um, let's try creating a box. And we're going to. Create a box like this for starters. And um, there, let's go to the default. Um, now, what we, we, what we were looking at was under surface modeling, one of the things we could do, so again, we, if we extrude a non-closed well, if we extrude a, a sketch in surface mode, we get surfaces, not solid models. Whether we extrude, revolve, sweep, loft, etc., all these things are creating surface models which have zero thickness. Um, the offset's kind of an easy one to take a surface and, and uh, a face of something and create an offset model, uh, which is a surface. So if we look, for example, at the front view of this, you can see the solid block we created, and then above here is a surface. Um, has anybody been doing anything much with surfaces in general? Not yet. Okay. Can you remind us of when we would be thinking to use the surface versus solid? I mean, what are the scenarios wherein surface is the way we should be thinking? Not so often in the woodworking world or the, the 3D printing world. It's not that often unless you're getting into really complex shapes. Sometimes it's easier to make a surface model and then add thickness to it. Um, particularly when you get into freeform stuff and um, some things like that. Um, excuse me a second here. I'm going to change glasses. Yesterday I was working on this as an anniversary gift, and the only way I could get the curved surface on this was to use a patch. Okay. And you were trying to get a curved surface. Yeah, on this heart shape. Uh, hang on. Um, can I see? I, um, uh, there we go. Okay, yeah, on the heart shape. Okay. And uh, the only way I could figure out how to get this nice curve on the surface of the heart was to use a patch and I, I watched a YouTube video about how to do that so um, uh, that's pretty, and then you 3d printed it yeah oh cool hey uh, Lem, do you have do you have perpendicular sides to the base and then only towards the crown do you do a dome type shape yeah that dome came from the patch mm-hmm and Tim how would you have done that if you didn't use a patch approach um, in a different package, I would use a, a freeform feature. And um, I think it's the same here. 
the if we're in solid you'll notice that there's a, a form menu here and I haven't really dug into it too much but um, it does allow you to do more sort of freeform shapes and, and push and pull on edges and, and round things and make them puffy, et cetera. And I think there's ways in here to do it. And I kind of wanted to get there. Um, not quite ready to, to go there today. Maybe, uh, maybe that's a subject for next week. Cool. Thank you. Um, it is, a, it, is, it is an interesting one. Sheet metal I talked about a little bit last time. Uh, the tools menu, I don't think we'll get into too much right now. These are, are extra utilities, add-ins. Um, make is you know, interesting to output. Uh, uh, there's three or four different ways to output your STL files or get to a print facility for 3D printing. Um, we, we've run into some of them otherwise in the, in the manufacturing, et cetera. And I uh, think there's people on the call who know that stuff better than I do already. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, I have a question, Tim. Sure. Um, you had mentioned at some point in the past, like McMaster Car, where you're importing uh, models, you, you had another site. I'm looking for switches. You know, uh, switches? Yeah. And what was the site that you had um, had well, used in the past? There's several of them, okay? One of the things you can do, you can come down here where it says insert a manufacturer part, and it gets parts for CAD, and that's got a lot of manufacturer catalogs. Oh, okay. Right. And it pops you into a web browser. Um, and okay, I'll, I'll check that out. I didn't know if it was a third. I had to go out to like a McMaster car and then bring something over, but this is already resident inside. That you, one is. I'll check, I'll check that out, thank you. No, no problem, and there's another one here. Let me see, can I find the chat window here? Um, there's one called GrabCAD. GrabCAD, and um, it's, it's an open source, site where a lot of people post stuff and you can find all kinds of things in there. Great. Thanks. Um, and not all of them will have step downloads, but, but some will. So I find, I find lots of stuff there. I, I think I understood Paul to be saying he wanted something where he could import things like I have a particular uh, single throw, the pull switch and I would like to get all the specifications for building a model. Is that what you were talking about, Paul? Uh, yeah, basically it's just, it's that, um, the concept of adding that limit switch on, on the laser. So I kind of got a, a model of the bracket fabricated, but to right. kind of take it to completion, import the right kind of switch and, add the hardware and the nuts and the recesses and all that kind of stuff to have a real life situation instead of a, just an esoteric drawing that, uh, that Got it. Yeah. Thank you. if you know the manufacturer like connectors and switches electronic components in particular if you know a manufacturer and, and a, a part number and you can usually find that on places like mauser um, or digikey yeah you can go to the manufacturer and download a step file, and then you import the actual 3D file. Now, you're looking for a, a step file as opposed to IGS. I, I'm not. Yeah, I prefer I, step. I don't remember the file extensions, preferred file extensions. Yeah, I just works too. I just is typically more of surface model. Uh, I've had better luck with step. Sometimes I just models come in and they have. Uh, they're like meshes that aren't quite closed, a little bit like some of the issues you have with STL files. Yeah. I've just found step files to be much more robust. Great, thanks. Uh, no worries. And so, you know, for example, if you're doing modeling at Wartura, I started that too uh, just before I left. And one of the things I did is uh, I went online and I found somebody had a model of a 3D printer. And um, so I grabbed the model of the 3D printer, loaded it in, and pulled components off it. So the little wheels that were giving me trouble because they were out around, they were already there. Other elements were already there, extrusions, 
um, servo motor, uh, the stepper motors, etc. And so I could find a bunch of those parts and just start assembling them. Uh, so like a vulture, you scavenged from a larger body for the pieces you wanted? Exactly. So like a, okay. like a software developer who goes and finds all these little bits of uh, algorithms uh, on the web open source that everybody shares, uh, I do a little bit the same. Much better version. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but you're making me hungry. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's there's that. So I'll, I'll you'll download it, and then once you've got it downloaded, you can come over to the file menu and just upload, and go find the file that you saved on your computer and upload it into upload it into uh, Autodesk Fusion and save it to a, a project panel, project folder. Right? Got it. Um, now, I don't think we got too far in the tools last time, but um, we did play around a little bit with press pull. Press pull is kind of a weird one because if you, for example, if you press pull on an edge, it gives you a fillet, which kind of makes sense. Funny enough, if I say okay, It'll actually save it as a fillet, not as a press pull. Um, if you press pull on a face, you can extend. And where press pull comes in really handy is uh, when you import geometry like a step file. So you have what we call direct modeling rather than a, a parametric model because you just imported this chunk of geometry, then you can go in and modify it easily using press pull and, and some similar features. And uh, this is actually a fairly powerful element within, uh, within Fusion 360 that I, I quite like. Now you notice here that the press pull post-dated creating the offset surface. So again, your timeline's important, your parent-child relationships. This offset surface was created from the original before I did the, uh, the, the press pull. And I think if I come back here and I edit this original block, for example, now it'll update because the original block predated the offset surface, the offset surface extended along with it, but it didn't go this way. Does that make sense? Parent-child. Parent-child relationships, yes. Um, okay, in, in the modified menu, the more common ones, fillet, chamfer. I think most of us are familiar with chamfers. Um, it's fairly easy to grab a chamfer edge here. You can do uh, equal distance, two distances, or a distance at an angle. Let's say we do two distances. We take a chamfer down a millimeter that way, and in a couple millimeters that way, and there's our chamfer. Um, we, we've used shell in the past, one of my one of my favorite features. So uh, we're going to say direction inside and we're going to select a body and uh, we'll say the thickness is, oops, that's too much. This is a small cube. Um, let's change the five to 0.5. And there's our shell. And we have, we've removed the surface we selected. We could select multiple surfaces if we so chose. Um, let's, uh, I'm sorry, Tim, that was an operation where you chose a surface and you then reduced, starting at the center, you reduced the 
perimeter to the thickness that you chose, that 0.5. Is that correct? That's correct. And okay. actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delete this and redo it to, to kind of show you something else. Um, it's great for making containers and boxes and things like that. So let's try the shell again. And this time we're going to select, uh, which button is it? There we go on the Mac. And we're going to say uh, thickness 0 0.5. And see, this time it removed the two surfaces that we had selected. And notice that, you know, it dealt, it dealt with all the features. It dealt with the radius in here from the fillet. It dealt with the chamfer, the whole works. Tim, if you had been using Lem's heart and your, the surface you chose for the shell was the bottom, and then you said a 0.5 millimeter, would it keep the contour of his, his, his rounded top at 0.5 millimeter all around, do you think? Yeah, it would keep the contour. When, when it comes inside, you know, if, if, the, if, the, if a surface like this is greater than the thickness, then it just, the inside one is reduced by that. So if this is a one millimeter, which I believe it is, fill it, the radius inside is half a millimeter. Half a millimeter plus a half a millimeter is one millimeter, right? However, one of the things you'll notice is it went a little wonky here in the corner. Because if we look at the outside, if we look at the outside, um, you see this, the, the combination of the fillet and the chamfer give you this shape here. But when you go inside, you start to lose part of this. So would it not be then uniformly 0.5 millimeters thick there? Well, it, it kind of is, but the radius here can't go negative. Where the radius on the outside is less than 0.5, it just goes to, a, to an edge, to a line. Got it. Okay, so that's, that's shell. That's, that's a fine one. Um, draft. So draft applies an angle. When you, when you uh, work with castings or moldings or things like that, usually in your mold, you use what's called the draft angle so that the part um, is smaller as it's deeper in the mold so that it can actually come out of the mold without scraping or getting stuck entirely in the mold. So these are exceedingly tiny angles though, right? Typically, yeah, typically you'll use uh, in, in uh, plastics and castings, you'll use a couple of degrees, maybe, maybe five degrees. In a tight area where you, where you need a long pull, you might go to a half a degree or even a quarter degree, but then you need <laughs> polish on your mold and, you know, it, it, it gets more complicated in, in mass production to, to use it. But... The simple answer is yes, small angles. Sorry, sometimes I get a little distracted. Um, so let's, uh, I'm going to delete the, the shell. So I have a surface here and I'm gonna show the, the, uh, the draft. So we do a draft. The first thing it's asking for is a plane. So this is the plane about which the draft angle happens. So let's say that I'm going to use this as my parting plane. And then um, the faces that I want to draft are this and this. And then the angle, um, you see how that flares out? Flare might be a term that People would understand more than draft if they're not in the industry, but they're familiar with 1970s fashion. Um, that's the basic idea. So there would be 10 degrees. So you see that now this device is, or this shape is wider at the base than it is at the top.
Tim, did you just make a reference to a 1970s bell-bottom uh, pant reference there? I was trying to see if you were paying attention. <laughs> Tim, was there only those two sides that were drafted and the two sides that we cannot see are still vertical? Um, these two sides are the ones that I drafted. The other, the other surfaces I didn't. Now, one of the, one of the things you think about when you do this, when you do drafting, is you want to do your drafting before, typically before you do the um, the fillets and the chamfers and the and the finished detail, because you want the you want the fillet to smoothly handle that that draft. And unless this does some kind of magic, um, if you try and draft, uh, whoops, cancel that. Uh, let's try and draft. I'm going to use this plane, and then I'm going to pick this face and see what happens. Uh, I'm getting a warning and an error, and it's not going to work. Hey, Tim, you chose the plane as the first step, and the direction of the arrow indicates that that might be the way you'd want to pull to extract from the mold. But Correct. by flaring outward, you'd be fighting that, as opposed to if you flared inward, you'd be able to remove it from the mold. So Am I reading it wrong? So typically what would happen with a part like this, and actually, you know what, let's get... That offset face is just, uh, whoops, that wasn't what I wanted. Where was the uh, surface offset? That's what I wanted to delete. Um, okay, so if I have an object like this, typically what I would do, now let's, uh, let's shell the bottom and we'll make this 0.5. So the, what it would typically do actually is the parting plane should really be this plane here, this bottom surface. And the part of the mold that forms the outside is called the cavity of the tool um, because it looks like the mold itself looks like a cavity. And then the part of the mold that creates the inside of the box is called the core. And when you mold this, typically the, as the part comes apart, it sticks to the core and comes off the cavity. And then as it moves completely clear of the cavity, you have uh, ejector pins or other mechanisms in the mold, which push it off of the core. And if there's no draft angle in there, this part is going to stick itself right to that core. What I think I misunderstood was we were making the mold. We were not making the part that was going to be molded. Is that correct? We were thinking about the mold, but we're actually designing the part. Okay. And that's a, that's a good point because some, some CAD tools um, really do have you design the two halves of the mold. And it's, it's, a, it's a mixed blessing because it does force – the designer to think about the manufacturing process and therefore usually get a better result. Uh, but on the other hand, sometimes it's better if you just design the parts you need and then you get the tool maker who's a specialist in mold making to figure out how to make the mold. Right. Now I do, you know, in a, in, a, in a simple part like this, it's pretty obvious that, you know, the, the parting line is um, this outer edge here all the way around. That's, that's the, the parting line um, between the two halves of the mold. And uh, so this is a simple part. But when, as the part gets more and more complex and you have side actions and lifters and, and, and different mechanisms within the mold to make geometry that's not in the straight line of draw, so you have holes in the side or protrusions or something like that, your mold gets more complex. Sometimes it's better just to let the mold maker um, figure out what can be done. And if it can't be done, then he gets back to you, um, he or she. 
but um, we're getting a little bit off topic with drafting. I don't know that, I'm not sure, does anybody do any casting, uh, resin casting or metal casting? I've been thinking about doing some cement casting. Not yet. Yeah, cement casting, well, usually, you know, you make forms, you break down, but depending what you're forming or what you're casting in cement, you might want to be thinking about draft angle as well. Uh, if you're making smaller cement objects, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, interesting. I, I haven't really, haven't really done any of that. Um, the, Sil silicon molds kind of is a kind of a cheater, cheating way to do it. You don't have to worry about draft. You just yeah, silicon. silicon molds are great because you don't have to worry about draft. You can do undercuts. You can do uh, little features that go against the line of draw and just peel it off. Um, and if you're doing very low volume, it, it's not bad. Um, you know, typically silicon molds are good for for very low quantities, five, 10, 15 pieces, um, depending on the geometry. And then uh, I've often used it for prototyping um, in the earlier days. Uh, nowadays, some of the additive 3D printing effectively, it's, it's almost easier to just 3D print uh, your five samples and away you go. Uh, unless you're doing metal casting, you might do, sometimes there's a hybrid method where you use um, your silicon positive to make a plaster negative, which is your actual mold for pouring hot metal into. So there's, there's, there's a, quite, a, quite a variety of different techniques for uh, low to mid volume production and prototyping. Some of them are kind of fun. Um, scale is a real simple one. Um, it does exactly what you think it would. We'll scale this device about, um, actually let's pick a, let's say this point here and we can scale this part up or down. And of course we can, you know, make a nice exact number if we want to. But Tim, I think you just showed us that much as in 2D images, if you choose a corner, it preserves aspect ratio. Right, so there's a, it says scale type uniform and non-uniform. Let's, let's play around with it. Yeah, see, if you go to non-uniform, now you can scale each of the three dimensions independently. But what if you grab the corner again? Um, basically, if you, if you want to preserve the aspect ratio, go to uniform. And the, the point is just, this is the point that's not going to move. All other points move except this point. So wherever this point is in 3D space, it's not moving. It's kind of can like the be, anchor. It's the anchor point. Can that be scaled on a parametric where that, point in space is dependent upon something else? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah we can. So scale's not something you use that often, once in a while. I mean, again, if you were doing uh, production plastic molding, you might include a shrinkage factor. So you scale it up by, you know, one, one point zero, three or something if you have a three percent shrinkage on your material and uh, scale it up and then go make your mold from this so you might take the positive and use boolean functionality to create your actual mold um, and we'll get to a little bit of that in combine a uh, timely segue there uh, quite accidentally so we only have one body here, but um, basically let's create another primitive here somewhere. How about, hey, Taurus. Tauruses are fun. Um, let's make a nice big, uh, not too big. 
And let's go with that and say, okay. Now we kind of did that on the fly and it actually did the Boolean operation. It wasn't quite what I meant to do, but it, it. Did we see you choose subtractive? Yeah, um, I think I, I, I grabbed the default. I, I, I did something I didn't intend to do. I started doing the Boolean feature and then I created the body without exiting. And what I really meant to do was first create the torus and let's this okay it's still doing that i'm still in the boolean feature the, the, the last drop down was cut on that form that showed up after you created torus okay let's try this again uh create Taurus. Oh, you know why? Because I don't have a part and I'm in, I'm in bodies. I need to do, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not following proper workflow. Dallas, you need to beat <laughs> me up for that. Um, I know you're, you're good at paying attention to workflows. So let's create this Taurus. And operation, new body, that was the difference. Um, okay, now here we have this torus, we can modify it, let's, let's move it um, down this way, and then let's move it in this way a little bit, just so it gets kind of complex. Okay. Okay, so now we have two different bodies. These could be two different components. And uh, the combined functionality is simply Boolean operations. So we can, we can join these two and they become one body. Um, we have the target body and the tool body. They're joined. We say, okay, now it's one body. I'm going to undo that for a second. I'm going to combine. And this time, the target body is going to be this object. The tool body is going to be this object. Now let's see what happens when we do a cut. So now we can choose to keep the original object or not, the tool. So the torus is the tool. So you can create a body or a component which is uh, being, being created for the purposes of a Boolean operation. So if, if we complete this and look at it, you see we have the hole that, that was the result of the, of the torus. Okay. Um, if We had said keep the tool. Now we still we have two bodies, but this one body has the cutouts. So if you notice, if I move this object, oops, away, it still has the cutout that was created by the tool, which was the torus. So this, for example, if you wanted to design a mold, you could take your positive object and make a block for your tool, your mold uh, steel, and then subtract your positive from that block. Um, you can probably think of other applications for it. Some of it may be just you, you're importing complicated geometry from a, a model that you find somewhere and you want to use that complicated geometry um, on your, your project. So say you take a, a board and you bring in complicated geometry, you subtract it away, 
and then you create G code and cut it out on the Shapoko. Does that make sense? I'm talking more than I'm showing, so that's usually yep. not a good yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I have a question. So could you do that then? Let's say you found a switch on the master, or an electronic switch or something, and you wanted to mount that in something. Would, is that the best way to, you know, you would pull that component that you download into it and then that would cut the hole? Or is there a better way to go about doing that? There's usually better ways. Um, I mean, you would download the, the switch, you would use assembly, which we haven't really talked about much yet, to assemble the switch onto your board and into the housing. And then I would usually use reference geometry from the switch to make a clearance hole around it. Because if you're, if you're talking about the housing itself, you usually want the hole to be slightly larger than the switch itself. Um, so that there's some room for tolerance, there's some room for expansion contraction because the switch has a tolerance on it in size. Got it. So there's no way to do the combine with uh, clearance, uh, adding in a clearance in that manner, huh? Yeah, there, there, there is, um, there, there's, yeah, ways the to, there's ways to do it but it would typically, um, wouldn't be using the combine feature to do it. I would be uh, referencing the switch. You could, you, could do, you could do this. Here's what you could do, actually. So let's say you've created the hole. Say this hole was your switch rather than Taurus. And now let's try something funky. Let's come in here. Grab this. Uh, that's going the wrong way. I think with the Taurus, it didn't quite know how to handle that. If it would have been a cylinder, let, let's try this. Let's create a um, cylinder. And where are we going to create this cylinder? Um, on this surface. And let's go from the top view. And the cylinder is going to be here, uh, new body, and let's take it all the way up through there just for demo. And we'll, we'll do a cut in this case. So in essence, when you go to create one of these primitives, um, it looks to me like we quickly get, um, we quickly get the ability to do the Boolean built into creating the primitive. So it's just like a shortcut. Now, having done that, when I come in here, if I press pull, this, can I go out? Yeah, so this is where now I could go out and say, hey, I want a, a, a 0.1 millimeter clearance around the cylinder. I've done that. And, uh, and now I have that clearance. Does that make sense? Great, thank you. Let me just edit feature and objects to cut. Doesn't give me the, in this case, it doesn't give me the ability to keep the tool. Um, if I created it as a separate body or separate component and then did the combine, I could keep the tool and then you could see that we have the, the 0.1 millimeter clearance. But, uh, so that's one way to do that. You could also so do a mortise, a mortise for if you draw a tenon on something, you could put them together and then just say subtract it out for the mortise. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So this hole that was created by the torus, because it was created by a torus, it's not really a hole. It, it's, like a hole. A hole. it's a hole, but the geometry is very confusing. Okay. This, is, this is straightforward. Geometry, because, because it's a torus, I'm thinking that 360 isn't quite robust enough 
to figure out what to do with it. Or I went the wrong way. There's another possibility. I just simply went the wrong way and it is actually fine with it. Okay. I thought it was going up or down. I, I didn't see that it was actually doing what, uh, what we wanted it to do. It actually is. So now if we were to, um, where's our move? Um, we can unmove, let's see. I, somewhere there should be a reset the move copy and back into place we would see that it that we have the uh, the clearance but I momentarily forget how to do that um, can you delete them from the timeline <clears throat> might be able to do that let's try it yep that worked so now you see we have that half millimeter clearance around the torus, just on the surface that we edited. Um, we didn't we didn't do that to this surface down here, so it's 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 flush on there. But we should be able to do this after the fact if we can find the appropriate face, which is this one. Let's go this way because we want clearance, not interference. And we'll go 0.4. And now we have the same same thing. We have a we have a clearance here. So that's where you know press pull kind of gets interesting, gets used in a number of different ways. Um, offset face kind of does a little bit the same. So if we offset a face, we grab the face here, we can offset it. Notice that it's just that face. And so it doesn't maintain the wall thickness. It moved that face and extended what needed to be extended to, to, to move that face. That's it. What if you made a cavity in that? How would you do? Can I make a shell, you mean? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what would it do with? Don't know that I can. Curious. Let's see what happens here. I, I, I don't think this is going to work. But I. Oh, it did. It did it indeed. Did. I'm impressed. <laughs> cool. It's smarter than I thought I was. It is smarter than I thought yeah, it was. Pretty cool. Yeah, that is pretty neat. Um, some of these kinds of things, you're never quite sure what the logic's going to be until you try them. Yep. Um, so offset face we did. Replace face is kind of interesting. And this is sometimes where you might use a, uh, a surface. So let's sketch onto um, this surface. And I'm going to come up here and I'm going to sketch um, and Say okay to that. Now I'm going to go to surface and I'm going to extrude the surface like this. Now with the torus, I'm not sure this is going to work. Um, I'm doing something that's a little weird to define, but let's try it. I'm modify. Whoops, let's go back to solid. We'll modify. Replace face. So the source face is um, this. 
and the target face is this. No, it doesn't work. The, the, the toroid didn't, didn't, that didn't cut it. Um, it was it difficult to define that. <laughs> What if you replace the surface of the box? That's let's what, let's, tr what let's that? try that because you know um, I thought it had to cut yeah, it. Same. I've used this to cut away, but does it work to extend it? Let's find out. So modify, replace face, replace face, source face, and target face. No, it doesn't work. Um, okay. What needs to happen is let's um, move. Okay, why will it not? Move tight, free move, yep. Looks like your buttons, looks like your buttons are covered up or something. There we go, that's all it was, yeah. buttons are covered up. And uh, the colors here make things a little bit confusing. Now I'm not sure this is gonna work either because, <clears throat> because of the, uh, the shell, we might have to undo the shell to demonstrate this feature. But one of the things I'm gonna do before I go much further, I'm gonna change the appearance of that uh, surface and let's, um, let's make it beige, oops. Okay, so, we're gonna try this, expecting it to fail. We'll replace face, this face, with this surface. And what happened? It's already done something. That's weird. Not entirely clear to me what it did there. Oh. I'm going to uh, do a simpler approach so that we actually demonstrate the feature. So the simpler thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a box. Come on, here and up here. And then I'm going to sketch on this surface. And here's where I'll do my fun spline. Now, the spline happens to be kind of uh, orthogonal with the box, but it wouldn't have to be. And then in surface, we'll extrude this profile um, this way and now the way this is really intended to work in solids is to replace this face to eliminate the with this surface okay now you see it's gone and if in fact i hide this, you can see that I've, I've created this complex face on my, what was and this a simple a box. Yeah, and it's a solid. And it's a solid, <clears throat> if that's you right. had done, yeah, if you had done like a Boolean and split that into two sections, you would then not have a solid on either one, right? You'd have to add a face to it or something. Well, here, there's a couple other things we can do. Speaking of which, we did replace face, split 
face or split body. So let's do a split body. If we split a body, let's grab okay. this body and we'll use uh, as a splitting tool, we'll use this face, extend it if it needs it, say okay. Now, these are two bodies now. See, body one and body two. If I move this body away, you'll see it's a separate body. And of course I can create that in, I can, I can turn that into a separate component if I wanted to. Yeah, you can make a stamp or something, a press like with, with that. Yeah, there's all, huh. there's all kinds of things. I mean, I'm kind of just doodling here, so I'm, I'm not demonstrating the, 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 the most uh, useful application of the features, but I'm just kind of wanting you to see what they are and how they work. Um, and everybody does different things. You can That's probably come great. up with better suggestions, better examples than, uh, than I can in a lot of cases. We've probably been over this, but over on the left side, you got the orange thing. Is that just, it's an open? That's good. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a, a surface, not a body, not a solid. Body. Okay, okay. So the, the, the cylinder is a solid and the open cylinder in orange is a, is a, is a surface. That's an icon for a surface. Uh, silhouette split is a little bit different. Um, let's, let's undo, let's go back to our, our, our nice little square here, or uh, box, I mean. And um, what I'm gonna do, the silhouette splits a body based on another plane. So say for example, first, first we're going to, whoops, that, that wasn't what I meant to do. Um, solid, modify, chamfer. Let's chamfer this guy. Let's go in a little bit and then go down a little bit more. Okay, so there's my chamfer. So now when I do a silhouette split, let's say I want to split this object in this direction. And this is the target body. Now it's split it at its maximum silhouette. And the silhouette must be planar but it split it there parallel to the uh, face that I selected to give it a, a, an angle. Again, that's not the best demonstration of the, of the technique. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of where you would use this. Basically, one place to use this would be um, if you had a fairly complex shape and you wanted a parting line for molding or for like, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for dividing between one part and another part of say a, a, a container or a box that you're molding, you could split it this way so that it gets, uh, it gets drawn this way. Now you can take these parts Uh, let's grab this guy and move him away. Now I could come in here and I could shell this guy. And uh, similarly, I could shell the surface away. And I guess that would be an application. I, I'm uh, sometimes the immediate application is not, or the best application is not immediately obvious. That would be the functionality. Um, move copy, we've done. Align. You can align something on one 
let's see here. I haven't actually played with this one yet. Oops. Um, let's align this surface with this surface. And that pretty much is what it did. So now those two surfaces are in alignment with each other. So it's an orientation moving, moving tool. You can flip it as to which, which face, whether it's a, a mate or an align effectively. Okay, so for most of the, the solid modification features, I think that gives us a little bit of a, uh, an introduction to them. Anyone have questions about any of these features that we've done? What I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time on materials, appearance, and rendering. I think, I think we're getting to the point where we can, we can take advantage of some of these. And um, let's see, we have, what do we have here, a torus? Let's start a new, let's start a new design so that we uh, can focus on on uh, a piece of wood. So I'm gonna do a real simple piece of wood. It's a rectangle. What Fusion 360 calls a box. Okay, now by default, the default material that I've set up, and I can go in here and change um, default materials, but the Fusion 360 default material is steel. So if I look at this body here, and I right click and I say properties, it's gonna tell me the physical material is steel, appearances is, is satin. Um, let's see, is there anything else I can do from a point of view of properties? Yeah, so, when I look at the properties, I get interesting things like the surface area, the density. This is the density of steel um, from the library, materials library. So this part here is a little over 800 grams, um, approximately a pound and a half if it's in steel. And this is the volume in cubic millimeters. It will tell us the bounding box, the center of mass, um, moments of inertia in the various axes, a bunch of physical dynamics uh, values that few people actually use. But um, the interesting thing is you can do a very complex shape and it will tell you how much it weighs or more accurately, scientifically, what the mass is. Now we can change the physical material. When we change the physical material, the density will be different and the properties will be different. There's a lot of different properties. Um, since we're in woodworking, let's go to wood and let's grab, for the sake of argument, cherry. And we'll assign cherry to this, this block of wood. Now you notice the grain here doesn't look like it makes any sense. The grain isn't consistent. In this case, it's just basically applied a decal to the surface that looks like wood. It, it, it hasn't applied three-dimensional wood grain to the part. But the material is now different. So now if I look at properties, it's going to tell me the area is the same. It hasn't changed. The density is radically different. And it's only 56 grams. Before it was 800 grams. Um, not a big surprise. Cherry is a lot lighter than steel. So useful information, particularly if you're looking at 3D printing, you can tell how much, what the mass of material is that your model should be using. Um, 
how heavy your part's going to be before you actually make it and the effects of changes that you make. Now, the, there's a difference between material applies some appearance, but appearance is a little bit of a different animal. So appearance focuses more, um, you can change the appearance. You could say this is steel and give it an appearance of wood. Maybe it's painted, maybe it's something of that nature. But appearance is really intended for use with rendering and for getting something that's more or less photorealistic. So we're going to come down, even though we've said this is um, cherry, let's say we assign a, a walnut, unfinished walnut to it. Well, that's too dark. Um, we can edit, and when we edit, let's see if we can get, um, better color out of it. Uh, let's just go to a different wood. Walnut, the, uh, the unfinished walnut is just a little too dark. Um, there are 3D woods, and here you'll see that the grain carries. The grain is carrying through, so we have the, the center, the rings here, and questions people always have, well, woodworkers always have is, hey, I want to be able to control the appearance of the grain, the angle of the grain, um, et cetera. And there are a number of ways to do this. So within, within this appearance, we can edit this 3D uh, appearance. Let's actually just move this, this uh, let's pan over so that when we, hang on, when we edit that we can still see it. So there's a couple of things that come up with the, with the 3D woods. You can change the late wood exponent. So the, effectively the contrast between late wood and early wood in the rings. I'm not even talking about the color here. Obviously we can change the color, but uh, I'm gonna go with their idea of cherry rather than my own. You can change the appearance of roughness of the early wood. Uh, it's hard to see what's going on there. Uh, the late wood roughness, you can also change. You see pores there. You can turn pores on and off. Is it smooth or are you going to have pores in the wood? Um, the, ring, the ring thickness is adjustable. And the, the ring bump, which kind of affects how the light bounces off it. There's also something called rays where you kind of see streaks in the wood. Um, you see the rays emanating radially, radially from the, the center of the wood there. When you turn rays off, that kind of goes away. So a lot of different things you can adjust in this appearance. Um, I'm sure there's people on the call who know wood much better than I do. I don't really know that much about wood. So uh, early wood and late wood is something that I've learned from playing with this. So I'm not sure if that's typical use in the industry or not for, for uh, what you call the various elements of the grain in the, in the rings. Any questions about this so far? Yeah, I'd just be curious if you could change the direction of the uh, end grain. Okay, let's do as that. As opposed to changing. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, so it's a little trickier to find. So it's actually in the render module. If we go to the render workspace here, render is um, a tool that 
gives us the ability to create photorealistic images. And it's, it's a little more complicated. We're not going to go into full detail today, but you set up a room or a scene and there can be objects that your piece sits on. You have, uh, as you can see behind the object, there are shadows. You know, the, the picture that's popping up here is an actual rendering of an object. That's a very good one. It really looks photorealistic. When you're in this space, if you right click, you get something, um, you, you have the appearance menu, which we had in solids modeling, but you also have texture map controls. And when you pull this up, there's a number of different things you can do. The, the most obvious one is the, the mapping transformations. So you can move the grain around, Ah, there we go. So you can move it in X, Y, and Z, although, you know, there's less impact there. And more importantly, you can change angles. So you can, and you can do that by putting numbers in here. You can specify, hey, I want the X angle to be, to change by 30 degrees. And now you see it turn. Or, or you can just grab it and, and do it dynamically. So if you really like, you know, a quarter sawn oak in an old piece of furniture, you can you can get your quarter saw in oak, um, partly by moving that, that um, uh, core, move the core wood right out of there. Of course, it'd probably be easier to move it out if I didn't have it on wanky angles there, but you get the idea. Does that answer the questions people had regarding grain direction? Yeah, that's an amazing feature. It is, it's a little complicated to get to. So I'm just gonna go over it a little bit again. I'm just gonna summarize. In either design or in uh, the render module, you go to appearance. And when you're in the render module, the only way I know to get to appearance is what they call the marker menu, which is using the, the right mouse button. And this is where you find your materials. And here, um, to get this full grain control, use the 3D, the 3D um, appearances. And you'll notice some of these have the download uh, symbol here. I haven't downloaded these. I just downloaded a couple to play with. But when you need other ones, if you're gonna, if you want to go to semi-gloss, curly koa, you download it. You can, if you get really complicated, you can create your own appearances. You can take um, an existing appearance and uh, and copy it or duplicate it, and then once you've duplicated it, you can edit it, give it a new name. Um, change the color, do a whole bunch of different things with it, give it your own name, own your own appearance. It's something that you're going to want to use again in the future. The same thing is true of materials. You can create your own material. Um, if you have materials of properties that aren't, aren't in uh, Fusion 360, now part of the, the, some of the things that come with materials include thermal properties and structural properties because Fusion 360 will do engineering analyses. It'll do what's called finite elements and do heat transfer, uh, vibration analysis, modal analysis, structure, strength, you know, torsion, all those kinds of things you can mimic. And in fact, there is a function in Fusion 360 called generative design where you it's a, it's a much more complicated um, subject. I haven't really gotten very far with it, 
but you define constraints of your design and effectively um, you tell it, you tell it, uh, I wanted to just show the picture and I blew it. Let's go back to render. Um, crap, I didn't mean to do that. Here you would define, for example, the wheel and the pivot of the caster and you define the interfaces and the part that's blue in this image was developed automatically by Fusion 360 to minimize material use. Now, when I look at that, I'll go, who could ever make that? And the obvious answer from you guys is, I can do that on a 3D printer. Uh, obviously, it's not a mass production approach, but it does, it can do some interesting things. And I think on render, that's about as far as I want to get. You can do in canvas render, it's not very fast, but it does a more uh, photorealistic image and then render creates a, an image file. And because Fusion 360 is cloud-based, and remember our files are saved, our projects are actually on the cloud, on Autodesk's server, it does a bunch of the calculation to do these kinds of renderings on its own cloud servers, uh, rather than making your local computer do the work. which is very 2020. I have a quick question. Um, so if you, I saw, I guess it's about the context menu or whatever it's called that pops up when you right click. It said something like repeat. Is that how you would, um, if, so let's say you spent five minutes perfecting this piece of wood here to be quarter sawn oak and you had a whole desk. I assume if you're editing one piece to get it to how you like it, the look, would you be able to use that to then make those same changes to the other pieces? Is that how you use that? I think repeat basically just brings up the last command. I'm, I think okay. that's... So then if you, I guess then the question would be if you, how worthwhile, uh, are you having to do each individual piece then? No, what I, would, what I would do is when I'm done, I would save that material as my material. So I would make the changes I want to the material and then create a new material, save it, call it, uh, you know, Tim's quarter saw and oak, and then just apply that material to all my other parts. Okay, thanks. Really, you're assigning a, an appearance, not a material. Correct, correct, sorry. Um, it's easy to confuse those two. I warned you about that, and there I go doing it myself. It's um, because it shows in 3D, you really think it's a material, but actually, it's an appearance. Now, if you go back to the design menu, does it go back to the way it was? Oh, it stays, okay. Yeah, the grain stays, all that stays. The appearance remains. It's just you're not in the render module, so now we're in whatever environment we selected. Remember, we can change our environment here. Um, we're in the photo booth environment. We could go with dark sky if we prefer um, reducing the light, <laughs> or um, there's a gray room environment. There's a Come on, tranquility blue. But for the most part, um, I just find the standard photo booth is the easiest one to work with. But yes, the grain remains, including the transformations we made to it. So, you know, 
this looks kind of cool on its own. It's nothing like photo render, but it's still uh, it's still pretty good to work with. Tim, on that icon that you were just clicking display, is that where you could make a uh, just a line um, a line drawing, not drawing, but just uh, lines instead of surfaces? Wireframe. Yeah, under display settings, visual style, they're shaded. There's uh, shaded with hidden edges. Now it shows you the black edges. Sometimes it's useful to see exactly where edges are. Um, some people do a wireframe with hidden edges, so you see everything in <clears throat> wireframe with visible edges only. And as you're going through a project, there's different times when it's when this is kind of useful to you to, to get some of the noise out of the picture. But for the most part, we usually like shading because it looks the most sort of realistic. If you took the toroid and put a hole in that, would it show the grain through the hole? Have you done that? Does it actually? It should. Let's do it. Because I'm seeing a bunch of woodworkers wanting to basically make their piece, make their design wood so it looks like stuff that they've been working with. Exactly. Right. Um, whoops. It looks pretty cool. I did that again. I keep doing that. So I want to create a new body. I want to create a torus here and let's go like this like this and like this um let's make this this was uh 75 let's make the torus diameter yeah 20 works but instead of cut i'm going to say uh, new body and then, um, oh no, I don't want to do that. Baby. Let's take it back, back to 20 is good. Okay, but what I want to do is modify move and let's move this baby up like this. Okay, now let's, uh, where's my combine? Combine, target body, tool body. Tool. Let's not yeah. keep the tool. Um, yeah. Let's do a cut. And yeah, boom, that. I see that grain. See all the grain. Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> Look at that. that. Happened to go right through the right through the core. Through the core. Yeah. That just looks cool. Yeah, it's it's like I say, I'm I'm impressed with Fusion 360. I, I for for uh, for as low cost a tool as it is, for something coming out out of Autodesk, it, it's really really quite good. And I I I imagine that there's a number of woodworkers in the club that are going to like the fact that they can show grain and show wood type, play with the colors, play with the finishes. Um, and see what things look like. Uh, I, I noticed the crack, cookie tray, cracker tray project that we kind of played around with the other month, I guess it was now. Um, I saw a nice picture of somebody having built that. And um, that's cool. It's, it's always fun to, uh, to create something virtually and then make the real thing. I think they've made several copies of it. Ah, that's pretty good. The, the, the uh, connecting CAD and CAM just gives you so much power. I'm looking forward to now that we can kind of get into the shop a little bit. At some point, uh, I'm looking forward to learning to use uh, Shapoko as well. There's a lot of things on the list, but that's definitely one of them. Anybody have any other questions? I'm 
think I'm kind of running, I think this is kind of a natural um, break point in the menu walkthrough. I don't think we want to get into assembly at the moment. I think that's a, a subject. We do want to get into assembly, but not today. Um, that's a subject for another time. But cool. any questions, other things, either from tonight or just in general? Tim, I have a, a general question. Let's say I wanted to make a coffee mug stand. Oh, the base is maybe a five inch, five inch diameter and it's really fancy. And then I've got a, a one inch or a half inch rod coming up out of the middle and then some branches out of it to hang the coffee cup mugs. But I wanted to make one design that had would fit four mugs and another one that would fit six mugs and another one that would fit two mugs. Is there a way to just have the one base two mug design and then just ex expand that one part to make it accommodate four mugs or six mugs all in one part? Yes, there is. I mean, you could make, if the base is say a block of wood and the and the hooks and the pedestal are a different material, then you could use different components to make each one. And then um, there's, there's several ways to answer your question. You can make one and then make a copy of it and edit it to be the second one and, and et cetera. And so you have multiple models. If you really want to get involved you could use parameters and your parameters would include things like pattern um, for the multiple hooks. And so you could actually um, create a parametric design in which you go in and say, hey, I want one that has 12 cup hooks. Not, maybe not that realistic, but and boom, 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 it makes them. You change it back to four, and it does a, a four mug version. Okay, and this would all be saved under one file name. If I had a, just a one immense folder with a lot of my uh, models in there, and I just wanted to call on coffee mug stand, I, I, what I'd like to do is be able to call that one up, and then within that one file name, change everything and it sounds like what you just described would do that if I did it parametrically. Yeah, remember remember what when we did the did... bookcase? Remember yeah. way back when we did the bookcase um, parametrically. We were able to uh, just change the number of shelves. Um, oh, we've got an oddball thing here to, to, to sort out with the uh, Change parameters, and one of our parameters was number of shelves. Number of shelves, 10. Let's change that to four. And we got five because there's four shelves plus a top. So you could kind of do something similar to that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Anything else from anybody? Has uh, anyone else set up uh, Fusion 360 to work with the Shape Oko or the uh, Nomad? I did, in case you want to see what I did in that area. <laughs> sure. Sure, let's, uh, I'm going to stop sharing here so we can see um you want to see can you can you grab it or are you just going to show the you know show fusion or are you going to show your part I'll show fusion okay. uh, it says host disable participant screen sharing okay that means i got to figure out how to do this participants uh where's my Where's my tools here? Okay, so I'm 
Uh, I'm going to make you the host. Okay. Now share screen, yeah. Do you see where where you have the option to share a screen? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Are you seeing it? Uh, yep. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so over here in the uh, main setup, I um, I had. Uh, let me get rid of these things. Yeah. <clears throat> I had set up the, um, let me cancel this. I had defined a uh, shape echo in nomad settings. And you see, I have the, um, in my local storage area, I have the nomad and the shape, uh, shape echo XL, which is what I have. And this is how I set it up. I basically just went through and, and filled out this, um, these forms here, giving the dimensions of the machine, uh, so the capabilities, the size of workpiece that it can handle, and uh, so forth. And probably the even more useful thing is I found uh, from Carbide 3D, that um, they had set up their standard bits. So if you see here, and if you're familiar with the uh, shape Oco uh, Carbide 3D bits, these are all the numbers that they, their standard numbers. And that was very useful, probably the quite time saving. Uh, what I found is I actually had to go to the select tool menu and then import the file that I had gotten from uh, Carbide 3D to define all these tools, all these bits. So any questions? You're much more advanced than I am, Len. So what does that get you? Does that allow you to export tool paths for each of those machines? Um, yeah, it makes it easier to do tool paths. And like if you've got the Shape Oco bit setters, uh, you can set up multiple bits in, in one uh, uh, file, uh, one G code file. So you don't have to have multiple G code files for each uh, bit, for instance. Uh, and you, all, you have that on the Nomad uh, also, where you can have multiple tools in a single file, and it'll automatically change over to uh, you know, the right point. Uh, if you have a VFD, uh, you know, a variable frequency drive, a spindle, uh, you can set your RPMs and so forth uh, in there as well. So it makes it easier to handle feeds and speeds and set up your bits on a job. Cool. Anybody else? Any more show and tell? Um, just something. Can you share a link to the tool library? The bit library? Sure, I could. Uh, it's If you look around, um, uh, you can find it. It's made by Winston Moy at Carbide 3D. Uh, but I could also put it into a Google Drive file and share it, and I'll do that as well as the two machine files as well. You can put it on the forum if you wanted, Len. Yeah, I'll put it on the forum, the link on the forum. Or if, I guess I, I can kind of put I files in the name. forum. Can I put files in the forum, or do I have to just uh, give you a link? Maybe a link is best, yeah. Okay, I'll put it into a yeah, Google Drive yeah. uh, folder and share that. You can sometimes cheat and change the extension to JPEG or something and 
<laughs> Lance, did you have something? Oh, I was just saying I found it once I typed his name in. Oh, there. Cool, in the chat window. I'm pretty sure that. Yeah. The chat window is the link. Cool. Well, I know this is the first time for me to actually finish early. I'm usually uh, notorious for running overtime with these things, but uh, I hope we covered enough material for, for everybody. Appreciate the extra input and the, and the questions. I really like that this, uh, these menu meandering sessions kind of become a, a way for us to figure out what other people are doing as well. And for me to see where the, where the, where the group is going, what people are doing with the tool. I just discovered something interesting playing with it in the background, the texture map that you were showing under render. Yep. If you do that once, switch back to design and then do a uh, right button, the pop-up menu, it says repeat the texture map and you can re then do the texture map in the design tool rather than in the render tool. Ah but I don't see it anywhere in a regular menu that you could get to it in design. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, I see that now. Um, actually, another one. Let me try something here. And that controls. Interesting. Yeah, there's some, that's a curious behavior. I'm trying to find, oh, there it is. Yeah, I can find it on the marker menu. I don't remember seeing it anywhere else. I've been staying away from the marker menu because I've been trying to stay away from the right clicks um, as much as possible when, when training, but it looks like we can get to things using that right mouse button menu that we don't necessarily get to any other way so it looks like we can find texture texture map controls in the design workspace by hovering over the wood surface and uh, doing a right click It's a bit confusing. Um, anybody else? Anything? Happy hour? Bedtime? All the above. <laughs> great. Thanks, right, everybody. Thanks. thanks, Tim. Thank you. Um, it's uh, great to get back and see everybody again and, uh, and, and see that people are making progress with the tool. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Yep. Okay, Welcome. Thanks. All right. Thanks again. Good night.